case at 12. Good morning, San Antonio starts right now. Right now on GMSA at 8 a.m., a recap of multiple shootings overnight. One suspect shot and killed after an interaction with police. How Chief McManus says it all happens and what comes next for the officers involved. Plus in today's leading essay, the president and CEO of the San Antonio Chamber of Commerce joins us live to talk about the economic recovery, the vaccine mandate, and the end Hispanic Heritage Month. And taking a live look out there at the Alamo City, the sun is up. Temps are still down, though, only 74 degrees to start your Sunday morning. What is the rest of the day going to look like? We're going to check in with Sarah Spivey in just a few moments. But for now, it is 8 a.m. this Sunday, September 12th. Thank you so much for starting your morning with us. I want to get right to Sarah Spivey because she was, like, warming up, getting like, ready to oh, go. Yeah. Getting stretched. Stretching. I have a lot of weather for We're not supposed to let people know that I was doing that. <laughs> you know, whatever it takes for us. We yeah. keep it real here, Sarah. Thanks. I was also getting ready for a busy forecast here. We've got a lot to talk about for the day, though. It's going to be generally quiet, so don't worry about too much when it comes to um, anything to interrupt your time outdoors today, although it is noticeably more muggy out there. And you can see there are clouds to start the day around San Antonio and the metro area as well as into the hill country. It's 75 degrees outside. We've got east winds at about five miles per hour, mostly cloudy to completely overcast skies and the humidity is high. Dew points are in the 70s. It's been a while since we've had high humidity. We've had a few days here where it's been nice and dry outside, but that's changing today. It's 74 in Hondo, 73 in Uvalde, 72 in Carrizo Springs, a bit of a cool spot up in Kerrville where it's 61 degrees, 74 in Beeville, 73 in Gonzales, and 70 in Del Rio this morning. Today's forecast will call for some cloud cover today, and you'll notice the difference in the mugginess. A little bit more humid outside today. 87 at noon, 93 for the afternoon high, and a few coastal showers are possible. In fact, there are some showers near Victoria right now. And beyond today, we're going to be watching very carefully the Gulf of Mexico. Right now in the Bay of Campeche, the hurricane hunters are heading to investigate this disorganized area of showers and storms for a center of low pressure. They're going to investigate this as a very high probability, 90% of becoming of at least being a tropical depression today or even perhaps a tropical storm by the end of the day. If it does get that tropical storm strength, winds of 39 miles per hour greater, it would be given the name of Tropical Storm Nicholas. Now beyond uh, the uh, today, we're going to be paying very close attention to this potential systems track because that has a big effect and a big impact on our rain chances in San Antonio. I'm going to talk about that coming up in just a bit. Max and Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. New this morning, investigators tell us an armed suspect is dead now after being shot and killed by police. Chief William McManus tells us this all happened at midnight along Pima Street near Somerset and Palo Alto Roads. So here's what we know about the shooting so far. Chief McManus says two officers were patrolling for an alleged drug activity when they spotted a suspect and approached his vehicle. He says the suspect noticed the officers were approaching him, so he fired several shots at them. Police returned fire, hitting and killing the suspect on the scene. Per protocol, the officer who shot the suspect will be placed on administrative leave. Both officers have been on the force for about three years. All right, another situation police dealing with overnight. A woman recovering this morning after police say she was shot by another SAPD officer. That officer aiming for the suspect. So this all unfolded around 2.15 this morning. This all happened at the Burnhouse nightclub on North Loop 1604 West. The officers tell us this all started when a fight inside the bar spilled out onto the parking lot. Now security in the area couldn't get the fight under control, so they called police for some help. Now they actually called from officers who were dealing with a crash nearby. Investigators say the three suspects got into their respective vehicles and then someone, one of the suspects inside that vehicle, started shooting at officers as they were approaching. Now officers shot back, but they missed one of the bullets from the officers actually hitting an innocent woman sitting in her car. Now she was hit in the shoulder, taken to University Hospital in stable condition. No other injuries reported. We are told the suspects still on the loose. They took off in a silver Mercedes. Well, a traffic stop on the east side leads to one man dead. According to the Bear County Sheriff's Office, deputies say they pulled over a vehicle with three women and a man around 1030 last night on I-35 in Hormel Drive. The man got out and ran off. Deputies say they ran after him, but shortly after the suspect 
shot, shot at them. Sheriff Javier Salazar says the deputies returned fire, striking the suspect behind a warehouse. The suspect was pronounced dead on the scene. Police say the three women that were in that vehicle, they are in custody, but have not been charged. And take a look at this news new into our newsroom for our eight o'clock hour. Firefighters are busy battling flames around 1 30 this morning. This is I-35 South near Osset Road. This is far southwest Bear County. Take a look at those flames. The county ESD and Von Ormy Fire Department tell us when they arrived at the scene, a vacant mobile home engulfed in flames quickly started spreading to an abandoned club nearby. The fire got out of control. Both were burnt down. Both the mobile home and the abandoned club burnt to the ground. Investigators not exactly sure how the flames started, but both buildings issued a total loss. Luckily, no injuries have been reported. Right now, crews working to figure out how and why this all happened. Well, I think it's safe to say our local companies and small businesses have been through so much, so many obstacles over the last 17 months. And with the recent uptick in COVID cases, President Biden's vaccine mandate and questions about economic recovery, there are still so many questions on the horizon. Well, joining us in today's leading essay segment is Marina Gonzalez, the president and CEO of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Good morning. Well, good morning to you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We're still feels like summer outside. So this summer still dealing with that surge of COVID. How has the economic recovery gone from your perspective? Well, absolutely. You know, in many ways, we have seen our local economy pick up in terms of demand. We see people out and about and shopping again and eating at our restaurants. Um, so what we're trying to do is just promote that and say shop local and make sure you're doing it safely. Make sure that you're operating your business safely and that if you're a customer that you are still keeping your favorite coffee shop or taqueria open here as we still navigate the, the effects of the pandemic, especially now with our Delta variant that we've seen recently. So Marina, what is your message to businesses around San Antonio who might be frustrated and concerned about the future? Yeah, to those feeling frustrated, I think we're all feeling that collective sense of frustration. Hang in there, keep going, um, keep operating your business and keep it open. Um, and give us a call. If you're not a member already, we have a ton of resources to make sure that you can operate safely and get you some of the, um, the opportunities out there. Whether you did the PPP loan, if you're doing your forgiveness, if you need help with any of that, if you need help with the local resources, that would be the message is there are plenty of people out here in San Antonio willing to help. We do see a big power in our community and our local economy with our small business community is very strong. Um, so don't give up. Things that better days are coming and we're here to help. That's such a good message. I know so many local business owners, you know, they have so many problems with that red tape. So it's good that your organization can help out. Now, President Absolutely. Biden has announced the executive order mandating vaccines for businesses with more than 100 workers. Have businesses already reached out to you? And, you know, what was your immediate reaction when you heard this? You know, my immediate reaction was uh, at the Hispanic Chamber. We just wish that we wouldn't have to get to a place where we are mandating a vaccine. We have been promoting it since it came out. It's safe, it's effective, and it is the best way out of this pandemic. So my initial re reaction was disappointment that we'd even have to discuss a mandate. Um, but you know where we're at right now? We have more questions than answers, given that we're still waiting on guidance of this executive order to be able to, to give some of those answers to our businesses that have those questions. So what we plan to do here is uh, carefully review what's coming out in the next few days. Um, and our goal is to ensure that our businesses have the resources and flexibility to continue to promote the vaccine without any experiencing any negative consequences. For example, having to pay fines that I know right now are being discussed um, per violation um, if one of their employees is not vaccinated under the mandate. Um, so we will wait and see, and we will remain uh, very vigilant in making sure that we've reviewed it and, and that we have that information ready to go for our members. And Marina, before we go, this week marks the start of Hispanic Heritage Month. So what does this mean for the Chamber, San Antonio, and the future of our city? Yeah, I think it's important right now to find those ways to celebrate together as a community. And each year, our Hispanic Chamber looks forward to Hispanic Heritage Month and, and leading that celebration um, along with our community. And, you know, we're, we were originally founded in 1929 by the Mexican Consul General here in San Antonio. So we definitely have enjoyed that rich history of celebrating our culture and the achievements of Latinos in our community. Uh, so what it means to us is this month we are kicking off Hispanic Heritage Month this upcoming Thursday on September 16th at Augie's Barbecue. 
we'll be out there with 104.5, our favorite DJ, Bico, who's going to be giving away some concert tickets. Um, we'll be there safely celebrating. So uh, come have a drink with us. Come come talk with us and let us know how it's going and what you're experiencing out there in the community. And, and we're looking forward to that, uh, to being able to do that safely on Thursday. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And anyone who's just tuning in, wants to watch the whole thing, we're going to have the entire interview. And of course, links to help out, get people where they need to go. Just head to KSAT.com. Thank you, Marina. Thank you so much. Time now is 810, 75 degrees out. We'll still head on GMSA. All right, here we go. We got the fireworks ready. UTSA dominating in amazing San Antonio fashion. We're going to give you the highlights next. September's National Honey Month, and we're going to be discussing all things honey with some honey pros coming up next. I heard a dog in the background. I wonder if it's going to be in a bee suit. All right, we got the puns loaded up. Don't, don't waste them here. All right, 75 <laughs> degrees, 810 this morning. Sarah Spivey will have our full forecast when we come back. Good morning, welcome back, and happy Sunday. Can you feel it? Feel it. There's a new buzz in the air today. So I think it's safe to say it's going to be a great Sunday. Jonathan Goto joins us live in Jordanton to talk National Honey Month. Jonathan, what's buzzing over there? A lot of stuff is buzzing, and it certainly is going to be a terrific Sunday, Sarah Max. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm in Jordanton, Texas, or Jordanton, Jordanton, that's how the locals say it. Here with Patrick Rakowitz uh, and his family, Rakowitz Honey Farm. Patrick, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for, for having us here. It's September's National Honey Month, uh, and with that, you're, you're our pro for, for this. What do you have for us this morning? Well, we, got a, we pulled a little supers yesterday, so we figured we can run over on how we extract all the honey from these supers and go from the process of extracting all the way to bottling. Um, can you show us what this looks like and, and what that, that process looks like of, of extracting the, well, the honey? Kind of in a nutshell, we go and we stick these supers on the bees, and this is basically how it starts out, a bunch of empty cells. And as the flowers start blooming, the bees start collecting nectar, and they turn that nectar into honey. What you see here is a honey frame that's full of honey and already capped and ready to be uh, decapped wow. and extracted. Wow, wow. Now, I just tasted this uh, right before we went live. And, and folks, let me tell you, the honey is absolutely delicious. Now, Patrick, after this, you guys take it to another, another part of the process, right? Yes, we have a machine right here that will actually pull these wax cappings off. This machine right here. As this frame is fed through there, there's a heated uh, set of cutting serrated blades right here that will actually pull this capping right off. Wow. And as it takes that capping off, it will kick it out the bottom. And then from there, we will take this frame and it will go into our extractor. Our extractor is basically a big centrifuge where it will spin and it will fling all this honey off. Well, Patrick, this, I am so excited, folks. Max, Sarah, I, I wish you guys could be here. This is really, really cool. Patrick, thank you so much for showing that. Folks, we're going to come back to you and show you a little bit more of that process, what it looks like once it is put here. And uh, Patrick's going to explain to us then how that uh, honey is bottled and, and uh, assembled and... and uh, I'm, Hopefully we can taste some more. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Patrick. Sure. Max, Sarah, back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. What an interesting, cool story. So much to break down there. I hope you bring samples, though. I know. I love honey. And Sarah, you were saying yeah. if you eat honey, mm. you know, every day, just a little bit, it can help you build up immunity to mm. the local The allergies. key there is local honey. So like mm -hmm. in Jordanton mm -hmm. there, they have very similar allergies all across uh, the San Antonio metro area. So Pleasanton, Jordanton, Seguin, New Braunfels, all of these areas that are kind of close by each other. You eat some local honey, you build up a little bit of immunity to the local allergies mm. and allergens out there. So 
Yeah, really neat. So thanks, Jonathan, and thanks to those folks in Jernton for showing us what that's like. Now, today, though, we're going to have a slightly different weather today than we have over the last few days, mainly in the form of humidity, a little bit more mugginess out there. You can even see right now as we're looking outside that those clouds are back. We've had a few days here of very low humidity, hard to find much clouds in the sky over the last few days. That's changing today. We'll see these clouds break up a bit and it's still going to be a nice day with plenty of sunshine out there. Just noticeably more humid. It's 70 at Bernie Stage Airfield, 73 in Divine, 70 in Seguin, 72 in New Braunfels, 73 at JBSA Randolph. Speaking of Jordanton and Pleasanton, temperature there 73 degrees, 73 in Tarpley, and it's still in the 60s up in the hill country, 61 in Kerrville. These morning clouds again, we're going to have partly cloudy skies during the Day today, but look at the future cast across the coastal plains from Houston down to Victoria down to Corpus Christi. That's where the main chance for rain will be today. Here around San Antonio, it's going to be hard to find much rain, if any, today. Maybe only a 10% chance. As you can see on the future cast, something wants to bubble up, but most of the rain should be confined to the coastal plain. Now, looking at high temperatures today 96 in Del Rio, 93 New Braunfels in the upper 80s in the uh, hill country, 95 in Catula, 90 93 in Hondo. Here in San Antonio, we'll have a high temperature of 93. It'll be warm and humid today, partly cloudy at noon and 87. East winds today at 5 to 15 miles per hour. And again, a few coastal showers, especially in the afternoon with a high temperature uh, near 93. All right, let's talk about the tropics. As I mentioned, this area of uh, uh, disturbed weather across the Bay of Campeche, it has a very high possibility of uh, developing in today into a tropical depression or even a tropical storm. In fact, as we speak, hurricane hunters have flown out there and are currently examining that area so far being able to find a, a wind speed of about 53 miles per hour. Uh, up there higher in the atmosphere. So we're going to watch this carefully. It's entirely possible that this will become Tropical Storm Nicholas within the next 24 hours or so. And the reason the hurricane hunters are out there is they want to find a center of low pressure. A center of low pressure is going to help with the forecasting models. Now, as it stands right now, many of the forecasting models have this system uh, just to the east of Corpus Christi and even potentially all the way out west, just skirting the Texas coast through Galveston. The, the, the track that this potential system takes is going to have a big impact on our rainfall forecast in the San Antonio metro area. If it takes a little bit more of an easterly track, we could actually end up with some healthy rains around San Antonio with flooding rains from Houston to Corpus Christi. But if it takes a more easterly track, What's going to end up happening is little to no rain in San Antonio because most of the rain will be focused around uh, that potential track with still flooding rains likely from Houston to Galveston, even down to Victoria uh, and Corpus Christi area. But again, little to no rain if it takes a more easterly track here in San Antonio. As it stands right now, though, we're forecasting scattered showers and storms tomorrow with only isolated rain for the remainder of the week. Uh, temperatures tomorrow, if we do get those scattered showers and storms, in the area will likely only be in the upper 80s. Either way, there's going to be more humidity in the air uh, with a little bit more cloud cover the next few days. Highs will be in the low 90s and we'll keep you updated uh, about the potential there for that tropical system in the Gulf of Mexico. Max and Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. 821, 75 degrees out. All right, we got a lot of college football to talk about. We are talking Longhorns. Not a great day in terms of taste of SEC. Well, we're going to break it all down. Good morning, welcome back, and happy 2-0. That's right, you heard it, UTSA 2-0, 54-0, and another record-breaking performance. UTSA Roadrunners hosting the Lamar Cardinals at the Alamo Dome did not take long for the birds up to fly. Sheldon Jones starting off with that 76-yard touchdown, weaving his way through defenders. Ooh, UTSA up 7-0 with 12 minutes left in the first quarter. You heard that right. Right before halftime, team jumped up to 34-0 in the third quarter. Josh Adkins playing quarterback for UTSA. Beautiful catch, Sakari Franklin, 32-yard touchdown, UTSA. Huge shout-out to Sincere McCormick. It was his birthday last week, and in honor of that, he rushed for two touchdowns, setting a UTSA record. Roadrunners getting their first shutout win in program history, 54-0. Undefeated UTSA hosting Middle Tennessee in a Conference USA game next Saturday, 5 p.m. here at the Alamo Dome. 
All right, Texas getting what they wish for. Got a taste of SEC football last night at Arkansas Razorbacks. The Horns' first three possessions, fumble, punt, missed field goal. Not how you want to start a game. Second quarter, Arkansas running back battles in. Five-yard touchdown, Hogsley 10-0. UT trailing 16-0 at halftime. Here we go, though. Third quarter, Texas. Wait for it, wait for it. Here we go. Charging your way in there. Rumble, big man, rumble. Get on the board. Trail 16-7. Skip over the last quarter. Arkansas makes a couple touchdowns. Ends on a high note. Texas ends on a low note. Losing 40-21. to Also, shout out Texas A&M. They won big. Quarterback got hurt. We're going to see what happens next. But the quarterback was last seen in a boot. But they did win 10-7. Hmm. There you go. Oh. Yeah, there's a lot going on. 827, <laughs> 75 degrees out. Well, still ahead in our next half hour, President Joe Biden is trying to prevent future terror attacks following the 20-year anniversary of 9-11, but not without criticism from former President Trump. Plus, justice on the horizon for a San Antonio family after their loved one was killed more than 30 years ago. We have the details in our South Texas Crime Stories. Good morning, welcome back and happy Sunday. I'm Max Massey. I'm Sarah Acosta. It is Sunday, September 12th. Yesterday we had beautiful weather. I was outside, I got some sun, I went on a hike. Max stayed indoors. I watched college football. I <laughs> ate way too much food. But if you are gonna go outside today, Sarah Spivey, what can people expect? Well, they can expect a little bit more humidity than the last couple of days. In fact, if you live around the metro area, you look up, you can see the clouds. Uh, in fact, let's take a look outside. Almost completely cloudy skies here. But, you know, there are those who don't have any clouds right now this morning. Here's a look at the satellite imagery. You can see very clearly that although it's cloudy around uh, areas northwest of 35 in Bear County, southwest, southeast of 35, there's not much cloud cover at all. In fact, near Seguin, it's fairly sunny at the moment. It's sunny in Floresville, Nixon Smiley area, but cloudy Canyon Lake, cloudy Sisterdale and Bernie, cloudy around Kerrville as well. And so we've got this area of cloud cover mainly just to the west of 35 here. It's 75 at the airport in San Antonio, 74 in Pleasanton, still in the 60s though in Kerrville, 72 in Del Rio and 75 in Catula. Now, if you're thinking temperatures are warmer than they have been the last couple of mornings, you'd be right. In fact, since yesterday, mornings are about 5 to 10 degrees warmer than what the thermometer was reading at this time yesterday when we were in the 60s. So today we've got increasing humidity with a small chance for rain, especially along the coast. And we'll be watching the Gulf of Mexico very closely today because it's likely that there will be tropical development into a tropical depression or tropical storm that will be impacting the Texas coast. In fact, coastal flooding is likely over the next few days, but I'll tell you what that means for our weather here a little bit further inland around the San Antonio area in just a few minutes. Max and Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we begin your top stories this morning with police investigating a shooting that happened on the city's southeast side. That's right. Limited information, but here's what we know right now from investigators. They say it happened around 1030 last night. A man driving on East South Cross near Pecan Grove. He noticed a car following him. Someone in that vehicle started shooting at him hitting him multiple times with gunfire. Now, the suspect drove off, jumped to curb, ended up in the parking lot. No word on the condition of the victim. We're also waiting to hear if the suspect was taken into custody, waiting to learn his identity, and waiting to learn what charges he will face. Well, we now know the name of the man killed during an argument on the southeast side last night. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office identifies him as 34-year-old Ronnie Riddle. Police on scene tell us he was killed around 9 o'clock at an apartment complex on the corner of East South Cross and Pecan Valley. Police say a 23-year-old man believed Riddle was pulling out a gun, so he also pulled out a gun and allegedly shot Riddle several times. He later died at the hospital. Charges are still pending for that 23-year-old man, as authorities say it's unknown if he was acting in self-defense. New Braunfels police looking for the person responsible for a deadly hit and run. So this all happened around 830 yesterday morning. I-35 North and Highway 46, that intersection on police tell us an 18 wheeler driver was pulled over onto the shoulder of the highway standing near the back of the trailer. That's when he was hit by another vehicle. The suspect did not stop to render aid. The truck driver pronounced dead at the scene. New Braunfels police say the victim, a 54 year old man from Dale, Texas. Well, one step closer towards justice. That's what's on the horizon for one San Antonio family after their loved one was murdered 
over 30 years ago. Eric Hernandez explains why it's taken so long to charge the alleged killer in today's South Texas crime stories. More than 30 years ago, in January of 1987, a 25-year-old San Antonio woman was found dead inside the bathtub of her home. It happened on Bailey Avenue, just off Hackberry Street. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, Diana Lowry died by asphyxiation, her death being ruled a homicide. Unfortunately, the San Antonio Police Department was never able to gather enough evidence to arrest a suspect, and the case went cold. Years later, it reopened and investigators found out 68-year-old Larry Moore was the owner of both his and Lowry's duplex unit at the time of the murder. He also had a spare set of keys to Lowry's apartment. It wouldn't be until 2005 that he was indicted for murder, but the case was dismissed just two years later. Almost a decade later, in January of 2018, one of Lowry's family members called the Bear County District Attorney's Office, asking why Lowry's case had been dismissed. Upon further investigation, the district attorney at the time, Nicola Hood, determined that there was sufficient evidence to prosecute more of capital murder. Larry Moore is charged under the capital murder statute as it existed in 1987, which means he could face death or life in prison with the possibility of parole after 40 years. If courts do reopen, the trial could begin on December 7th. Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Well, as the nation reflects on the tragedy of 9-11, President Joe Biden is still grappling with the after effects 20 years later, ending the war in Afghanistan while trying to prevent future terror attacks. Now facing fresh criticism from Republican Party and former President Donald Trump, ABC's Mary Alice Parks and Whit Johnson explain. Like you said, the country reflecting on how the attacks on 9-11 led in turn to the country's longest war and what it means now that that chapter is over. Has the country turned a page? The president was asked yesterday if he thought the country was entering a new phase with troops no longer on the ground in Afghanistan. He said he did. What's the strategy? Every place where Al-Qaeda is, we're going to invade and have troops stay there? Come on. American people think it was time to get out of Afghanistan spending all that money. But the flip of it is, they didn't like the way we got out. But it's hard to explain to anybody how else could you get out. For example, he argued again that the war effort there in Afghanistan had morphed over time into one that was just too costly trying to unite Afghanistan. Whit? And Mary Alice, yesterday we saw former presidents participating in 9-11 ceremonies. Former President Trump was not part of any formal event, but he was in New York and he had tough words for Biden. Yeah, President Trump was not there at Ground Zero, but he stopped by a police precinct and fire station near Trump Tower. Yesterday, like you said, a somber day, many delivering a message of national unity. His comments stood out. He turned quickly to criticizing President Biden. It was gross incompetence, and I hate to talk about it on this day, but people are saying, why are they talking about what the hell we did? It looked like we retreated. It looked like we gave up. Like, they used the word surrender. Remember, President Trump also wanted to get out of Afghanistan. His team negotiated that final end date with the Taliban, and his team oversaw a deal that led to the release of thousands of Taliban prisoners. That was Mary Alice Parks reporting. As many reflected on the 20-year anniversary of 9-11 across the country and here locally, residents spent yesterday afternoon remembering what they were doing when the planes hit the Twin Towers. One woman said she was a toddler when her mother started panicking after seeing the news. Another says she was at home watching the tragic moments unfold, devastated because she felt like she couldn't help. Isaiah Cozy says he was six years old living on a military base with his father, who is now a veteran. After processing what happened then, as an adult, Cozy says he wants the world to come together at all times, not only when tragedy strikes. Does it really take tragedy or something terrible to happen for us to, you know, get together on something? Like, why does it, why does it take that? Um, why, why is it that when things are good, we just get more petty? And, and then when something terrible happens, we, we want to come together. And, I, and so sometimes I lament that that's how things seem to go. And there's a pattern of that over our nation's history. Well, we've been sharing the stories and experiences of those affected by 9-11 all week. And you can watch them all right now, including KSAT's coverage on that day. Just head to KSAT.com. All right, let's take a live look out there. The Alamo City, 76 degrees out there right now. Can you feel the buzz? 
beautiful. <laughs> In the last half hour, we got a glimpse of how a Jordanton beekeeper harvests honey. It was an awesome situation. We I got to see him break it all down. I love this story so much. That's because September, did you know this, is National mm. Honey Month. There you go. And our Jonathan Cotto joins us live once Whoa. again in the process. Hey, Jonathan, what, what are y'all doing out there? Hey, hey guys, oh you guys, they're putting me to work here. I'm part of the family now and I'm gonna be part of the business here shortly. But what you guys caught me doing here is putting a deep frame into the decapper, which is gonna extract, is what we learned earlier. After that process, uh, that frame drips all that honey and that's where we collect it here and it turns into this right here, Max and Sarah, this liquid gold. So technically, September's National Liquid Gold Month because it's so delicious and so amazing. But Patrick is gonna tell us what the next step is from, from this, this process right here. So after it's been extracted, we fill the tank up to a point and then we'll open up this valve and then from here, you'll start seeing the oh honey coming out. Oh my goodness. Out. Once the honey comes out, it'll run through these set of screens and get filtered. Now we only filter the big stuff out of it. We do not run it through a fine mesh filter. That way we wow. keep all the pollen and the good stuff in it. And then after that, it will go into our bottling tank right here, where we will bottle everything and have it all ready for sale. Now, you mentioned, Patrick, that uh, you guys don't filter the honey, so it, it keeps all those essential, essential and important nutrients within it, correct? Yes, sir. That is correct. That way, all the good bacteria, all the pollen that everybody needs to help boost their immune system during allergy season and everything is all bottled up right here. Now, Patrick, you were explaining to me uh, earlier the, the process of this bottler here uh, and how honey is essentially or technically should be in a, in a solid state because of the lack of water. Correct? Yes, that is correct. So that's why all your honey you see over time, it will eventually crystallize. It'll turn to sugar. Now, that does not mean that your honey has gone bad. All you need to do is liquefy it again. Usually we recommend just taking a pot of water, bring it to a boil and put your honey in there so it'll bring it back to that state. Perfect. Patrick, thank you so much. Max, Sarah, we're going to continue to hang out here and finish up these, uh, these bottles here. We have quite a few to fill up, and I am so here for it. I've been wanting to do this for the longest time, so I have to thank you, Patrick. Thank yes, you sir. so much thank for you. letting us thank be a you. part of this. Folks, we're going to have a detailed report of this entire process and how the Rackwitz family got involved into this business and how long they've been doing it. And that report is going to be coming up on KSAT 12 at 5, so make sure you tune in. Reporting from Jordanton. Jordanton? Yes, sir. Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. That is Thank you, awesome. Jonathan. You bees are so important. I love how learned you were on the subject, too. You're like, yep, yep, I got that one. Well, no, I got that I, I love bees. <laughs> yeah. Very important. They're such, um, we need our pollinators. Yep, absolutely. All right, 843, 76 degrees out. Well, it's almost the perfect time to cook outside, but if you're tired of the same old, same old, why not try pizza? 12 on your oh. side puts the portable pizza cookers to the test. That's next. We'll also have a look at the forecast with Sarah Spivey. With pizza? There's nothing like wood-fired pizza, but at home, portable outdoor pizza ovens claim to rival your favorite pizzeria. Consumer Reports' Paul Hope says it's all about the heat. Portable pizza ovens are everywhere, and they claim to get to really high temperatures that you could never reach in an oven or even most grills. So naturally, we had to take a look. So in his own backyard turned test lab, he tried several tabletop pizza ovens designed to make one 12 to 13 incher. Some use propane, others charcoal, and wood or wood pellets. He made each pizza with store-bought dough, added sauce, and mozzarella. The results all turned out pretty tasty pizza. So what it really comes down to is how easy the oven is to use and whether you prefer gas or charcoal cooking. You want that wood-fired flavor like you'd get from a great pizzeria? You really want one that uses charcoal. Paul found this Uni Karoo to be convenient and sturdy. It has a chimney damper to regulate airflow, important for high heat, but it's pricey at $350. For less money but still good results, he liked this wood and charcoal burning WPPO La Pepe. It comes with a little peephole to check your pies because they bake fast. If you prefer the convenience of gas, CR says consider this Bakerstone Original. And one more thing, there is a learning curve, so you're going to want to practice a lot before you invite company over for pizza. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. She's right about that learning curve because we were trying to bake pizza over 
parts of the pandemic and yeah, it's, it's a little challenging. You got to get that crust just right. OK, well, taking a look at the radar, you can see that there are some showers across Port Lavaca, Rockport area. Uh, coastal showers are going to be the main story today and honestly for the week. In fact, coastal flooding will be possible and zooming into Wilson County. There have been a few sprinkles out there near Sutherland Springs and Stockdale, and so I would not be surprised if you see a couple of sprinkles early this morning, especially where the clouds are the thickest and we're seeing some of that cloud cover right now around San Antonio uh, areas west of 35 have clouds while areas east of 35 are fairly sunny at the moment and this uh, camera here is near the airport so it makes sense that it's picking up cloudy skies 75 degrees the biggest thing you notice outside right now, other than the clouds, is that it's actually muggy out there. And for the last few mornings, it's been nice and dry and comfortable. That's not the case this morning. Although temperatures are not too warm, the humidity is fairly high. 75 in Canyon Lake, 75 in Hondo, 74 in Yavaldi, and 75 in Pleasanton. Still in the 60s, though, up in the hill country. So we're going to have partly cloudy skies today. As I mentioned, the coastal plains are going to be the area with, with the best chance for rain today, about 20 to 30 percent and around the metro area it's entirely possible for us to see a stray shower today but the chance for rain is really only about 10 percent instead it's just going to be hot 96 for the high in del rio 95 in Catula, in the upper 80s in the hill country so not too bad up there in the higher elevations 93 in gonzalez speaking of 93 that's going to be our forecast high today and again you'll notice a little bit more mugginess in the air than the last few days we'll be at 87 at noon 93 at 5 p.m 82 at 10 p.m east winds today at 5 to 15. But as we've been talking about for the past several days, there is an area in the Bay of Campeche that is likely going to become a tropical dis uh, depression or tropical storm Nicholas today. If it can, if it has strong enough winds, it would be considered a tropical storm and get a name. Very high probability of development and the hurricane hunters as we speak are currently in that area where that low pressure would be. They are looking for the center of low pressure to see if it's organized and they're taking all different kinds of measurements, air pressure measurements, wind speed measurements. They're going to be reporting back and then the National Hurricane Center is going to take that information and determine if we do have a tropical depression or a tropical storm on our hands. It's also important work they're doing out there because they're finding that center of low pressure and until that center of low pressure can be defined, we're going to have a bit of a wonky forecast, okay? Because there's going to be a widespread of possibilities of where this potential system could go. But it does look like the heaviest of the rain will be from Houston to Corpus Christi, seven to 10 inches of rain, pockets of 10 plus inches of rain. And we're going to be on a fine line here in San Antonio. A difference of 30 miles can result in a big difference as far as rainfall potential goes. But what it is looking like right now is that we'll have scattered showers and storms tomorrow, 40% with only isolated rain uh, during the week. But I do believe that the biggest threat for flooding is well to the east of San Antonio, but unfortunately for our coastal communities and we'll be watching that and monitoring that very carefully. Sarah and Max. Thank you, Sarah. All right, 851, 76 degrees now. Well, an activist who wanted to preserve San Antonio's history at all costs, tomorrow on GMSA, we tell you the story of Adina De Zavala in our Tejano Moment series. And the news you know, need to know before you go, several situations overnight and into this morning. Multiple suspects shot and killed and the circumstances surrounding each one under investigation. You can read about each one individually right now. Just head to KSAT.com. Increasing humidity today with coastal showers and a high temperature near 93. Meanwhile, there is a good chance for scattered rain tomorrow as we are continuing to watch the tropics. It's likely that we'll get a tropical depression or a tropical storm in the Gulf of Mexico by the end of the day. We'll keep you updated on air, online, and on the KSAT Weather Authority app. Pollen count two will come in later this morning. Thank you, Sarah. That's it. Have a great day. Have a good Sunday.